So that was Trinkle Tinkle with Thelonious Monk and John Coltrane. One of my favorites. That's just amazing. Yeah, I, it's it leaves you speechless. Um, a couple things that you know I uh, think about when I hear that is w- one thing is is about musicians and composers playing other people's music, and Coltrane obviously coming up through these bands with Miles and all that. Uh, I think sometimes certain musicians don't get enough credit when they can play other people's music. Because there's a lot of great musicians who can't play other people's music, you know? And Yeah, yeah. It, 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 people don't have any problem in classical music giving it up for the violinist who's really great at playing Beethoven, right? <laughs> yeah. But in jazz, it doesn't really always work out that way. Yeah, and so to hear Coltrane, I guess all those ones of practice <laughs> and working with, with Thelonious uh, paying off, I mean, he just so absorbs the... The, the 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 monk concept somehow it's just yeah, I think I think in 57 train is now now that he's sober he's really putting on a, a a clinic of how to play bebop double up vocabulary this is like what he's playing 16th notes and when he's playing the glissandi and then he's cramming too uh, they called it cramming where you cram as many notes as you can into each beat now uh, Monk's got his band playing that very spare doom to doom, doom to doom. Yeah, mm, 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 bang, bang, bang. There's the quarter note train, go to work. So uh, uh, transcribing it, actually, believe it or not, transcribing 57 train is relatively easy because I slow it down and I loop two beats or loop a measure and I slow it down to half speed. It's very easy. da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da you know, it's very, it's not hard at all. It's later on it becomes uh, sonically difficult and there's, but the cramming that he does sometimes, he's cramming as many notes as he can into a single beat. They used to call it a cramming. I think that's a funny term. And Train's already doing all the hip treatments on the, on the minor chords. He's already playing melodic minor or he's playing, uh, let's say, uh, the opening chord is a B flat minor seven. He already plays not just B flat melodic minor, but he plays F whole tone. So you go to the five and you play whole tone off of that. And you get all the exotic notes and a couple extra, right? And, and uh, so he's already doing these ultra modern things that he's going to be blasting on in the '60s. But he, they're already here. The the, the register leaps. Uh, Bobby did. Bolly da. They doing the low notes and then going back up. And uh, kind of you know, juxtaposition like that. That's 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 already there. He's going to be doing that quite a bit later on. And um, how about how spare Monk plays on his own solo? He just kind of plays the melody and leaves all this space for the bass player to play. And yeah. then that's my favorite bass player uh, with Monk and with a lot of guys. Wilbur Ware. He's one of the giants of them all. Wilbur Ware. Uh, Train talks about how great it was to play with Wilbur in Monk's band. And he says, well, we're not really sure what he's doing back there, but it sure does sound great. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he he kind of very naturally plays all these tritone substitutions that make the music kind of sound eerie as it moves around, as the harmony moves around. And he just kind of adds them all the time. And that's just part of what he does, this kind of chromatic tritone motion thing that he does and that plunky wonderful plunky sound and it swings like a bitch and it, it's just great it's well yeah. aware yeah great great tone uh on that yeah song. and yeah he's one of my favorites uh and i wasn't you know when i was doing my little research for this uh episode or for this part two um I, I knew the name, but I didn't know anything about him, so I did a quick look at his resume, and pretty impressive who he's played with uh, over his career, and just uh, an excellent, excellent musician. Well, there's funny stories as you get to know these guys, in a sense, and their their real story. You know, uh, Wilbur Ware was also, uh, during the day, he would sometimes be the janitor at fucking Prestige Records. Wow. Because he needed some money, and didn't, you know, jazz wasn't paying a lot in those days, and all the guys had habits to, to feed and, you know, it was a pretty thankless thing. You know, we put them on a pedestal now because they rec- they're they such great musicians and we love them so much. And how about that? The guy's the janitor. Ah, it wow. breaks your heart. Yeah. Breaks your heart. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, like, back to what you, you were saying earlier about how so many of these musicians were um, drug addicts and also incarcerated. I mean, again and again, every time I look up anybody's uh, biography of some of these, you know, the, the rhythm players or the lesser known guys, it's just over and over again was incarcerated for six years here yeah. in and out over here. Well, it's here. the same as it is now, right? It's that the cops are are are, are coming after these guys. The yeah. cops are targeting them. The racist fucking white cops are going after these guys. Yeah. Surprise, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> but the, the thing about the being a janitor broke my heart. You know, it was like, do you remember the story, uh, Keith Richards coming to Chicago to Chess Records? I mean, you know. He's got Muddy Waters on the pedestal like nobody's business, and he shows up at Chess, and Muddy Waters is painting the place. Wow. Yeah. You know, like a like like painting the place, like you know, wearing painting clothes. Oh, my God. But is he getting, like, you know, two bucks an hour? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, back to the music. Um, the other thing, you know, is, is uh, your – Coltrane's – Breaking into solo, and you know you're expecting that kind of red garland playing all the changes, playing all the chords behind, and then there's Thelonious Monk just making these little little reminders of the melody. Da, 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 you know, um, yeah, he and not sets even the play, table, not though. playing any, not playing any kind of of the, the of the chords, um, but kind of connecting as as Coltrane's, you know, just going on his mind-boggling, you know, blowing uh, solos. He's there just to kind of reconnect you to the source material. And that's all he needs to do. Right, at that right, point right. In time. He waits for the he waits for these moments in the bridge. There's the, the the latter half of the bridge, and he always comes in with exactly the chord that he plays during the melody. Like, all right, just in case you're wondering where you are, bring, 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 and then he lays out again. It's great, <laughs> really great. Uh, then, you know, that's something to bring up right there is that um, the comping. The accompaniment, the comping of the pianists like Monk, um, that's a lost art form, just like big band is a lost art form or horn blending is a lost art form. People don't know how to comp anymore, especially guitarists, but also pianists. They they just play through everything, everything. Like You just played your solo, and then now it's time to accompany the bass solo, and they just keep playing chords. Like, wait a minute, you're supposed to be quiet. And then you're supposed to play a couple of chords based on what the bass player is playing. And that's it. You know, go for a stroll. They call it going for a stroll, where the piano player goes for a walk. He leaves the stage. Monk's great at that. He doesn't play. He'll comp the first chorus. Then he goes for a stroll. He dances around. He doesn't play for two choruses. And then he comes in for his solo. And then he still kind of just plays the melody, lets the bass player plunk away. Now it's a bass solo. Bass player just kind of walks or something, and Monk doesn't play a single note. He yeah. waits and head out. Now, that using that space and having that uh, makes the whole thing really listenable and sound really great, and uh, that's another lost thing in the music. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, and I think, yeah, again, you listen to these tunes, and, and, and also um, just the sense of... of Dynamics. I mean, you get such a story when he tells a song like that. There's humor, there's mystery. He, he's just always got these different elements always swirling along in these songs, and it's playful uh, and delightful to the ear, and then yeah. a little strange to the ear. And, and yeah, and it also swings like crazy. And then it's boogieing. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> he, it doesn't get so I picked out the next track because there is no piano on it, and the bass player. He didn't, I don't know how much he recorded, but I don't know if I have any other recordings of this guy, Earl May, and he sounds great. He's playing all four gut strings, a really dark, kind of frampy, uh, really dark tone. It's really beautiful, and um, I really like the, uh, there's a couple of tracks that they play on this, on, it was released on Lush Life, but it was released on a couple of different records, And uh, but this is the session in... Uh, August 16th, where Earl May and Art Taylor, the great Art Taylor, the best fast drummer, who, when you want to play fast, you call Art, but he also grooves like crazy on everything else, too. He's just one of the, one of the jazz giants of all. All right. So let's listen to uh, John Coltrane playing I Love You. <laughs> 